Well, Matt, welcome to the pregame hangout. Uh, for the moment, it is just myself and Mr. Yang Yang Wang here. Um, everyone else is doing stuff, and uh, that's totally cool. Um, yeah, big day. They, if if things go according to plan, uh, you might get the answer to a couple of big mysteries. We'll see. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, um, you were going to say? You mean like for the session later and like the Golden Raven? Yeah, I do. Ah, interesting. That's, okay. That's what I mean. Um, but uh, in the meantime, um, I am still gathering artists for my uh, Westgate campaign guide, which... We're talking about on the Discord. So if you're not part of the Discord, please join the Discord and uh, get up to date information about that. If you or someone you know is arty and wants to get in on some of this for money, of course, um, let me know in the Discord. I posted up a list of art pieces that I'm still looking for. Um, a couple of them were claimed, but most of them are still available. So uh, yeah, just. Um, come and swing by, even if it's just to say, hey, this is cool. I'm glad this is finally, finally happening after you've been talking about it for two years now. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so like right now, you're just looking for visual artists, but uh, in the future, will there be any calls for any other sort of artists or contributions? Mm, maybe. Um, one thing I do want to put in the book and I haven't really got time to doing yet is um, creating a bunch of like little miniature adventure sites um so if you are interested in doing a little adventure design that you think might fit in the uh, context of westgate and fit the feel i mean i might be really interested in that so um you heard it first on the hangout here keep your eyes peeled for when i talk about that in the discord oh that's cool yeah that's rad um rumpus imperator offers to do interpretive dance for you so uh how uh -huh. much would you pay for that for the source book interpretive dance for the source book um, I think I would pay negative $50. So Rumpus Imperator, if you want to send me $50, I will include your interpretive dance in the source book. Oh my God. It's been said. So it will happen. So if, this, <laughs> if you give him 50 bucks, <laughs> you can have your dance in the source book. Now, I, also, I'm going to have to figure <laughs> out how to, how to do that. So, um, <laughs> yeah. we'll see. <laughs> Anyway, check out the Discord. That's where we're having this conversation. <laughs> yes. I also muted myself. I have no idea what I missed. <laughs> Talking about Eric's source book. And an interpretive dance. Apparently. Eric, Eric made a call out to uh, you know visual artists, so I asked like what other sort of art he might want in the future, and one of our viewers offered his interpretive dance services. And I said, if he, uh, it would be negative $50. So if he pays me $50, I might include it. Got it. Got it. Completely random. Did you know Zoom has this touch up my appearance thing? Uh-huh. Yeah. Are you touching it up right now? This, so this is touched up. I have like no pores. Also just no angles on my face. It's all just like. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't Zoom notice any difference in my own video whenever I try that. So, uh, they essentially just take off like you know little dots or like spots on your face and mm. generally light you out. Mm. Oh my Instant god! foundation. All these things on my throat just go away. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let's see this. Ta da! <laughs> Do I look different? You look a little plasticky. <laughs> I feel like that makes me look even shinier than usual. Like Zoom, I know I'm a really white guy. You don't need to keep butting it in. Like, hey, you, you glow in the dark. Anyway. <laughs> hey, Emily, Celadrine says now you really look like an Avario. Aww. Seldrin is one of our resident uh, Fey uh, fans, so that's a big compliment from uh, from her. <laughs> yes, and then uh, original oh. Angston followed up with, "But you're pretty fly." 
Hey, welcome back, Emily. Excited to have you here again. Yeah. How were the uh, over the last two weeks? Um, interesting. What happened the last two weeks? Yeah, that's what why, I thought. Why, I know, right? I don't remember why I needed to step away in the first place. Sick, sick kid. Yeah, sick yeah. Sick kid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, not sick anymore. So. Good. Young children will do that to you. I've uh, heard. So. It also spread throughout the rest of your household. Get you and your husband. Yep. Pretty much. Bummer. Let's see. I'm trying to think like I know she started doing some more stuff recently but it's like I'm trying to actually remember and I can't untangle the last two weeks from like the last two months of my life <laughs> time is it a flat circle golden, the golden raven's influence <laughs> yep uh, so Aaron did everybody mm -hmm. read that blog post that Aaron put up? No. Hey, you tag. didn't read that blog no, post? No, I read it. You oh, asked okay. me if everybody read it, and then I oh, looked at Eric's see, blank face, and Emily's shaking head, and I went, no. <laughs> oh, I thought you, that you hadn't read no, it. No, I, I had like, read what? it. <laughs> I read it. Yeah, I thought it was good. I don't know. Did you? Did we want to talk about it? Is it on our, on our website? Uh, I posted it on um, in the Discord. Oh, OK. Um, I have been was, pretty busy, so. So it was. It was. A, nice. It's a post from Keith Baker, who is Keith-Baker.com. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. Because oh. he was. Uh, we had him on writing about dragons and shit, which is not this week's episode. It's next week's episode. Um, but I thought it kind of dovetailed nicely with some of the stuff he was saying about um, building in magic systems and stuff. But the kind of idea of like when you are a DM, when your players want to do something they can't do, what happens? And he gave the example of like people playing Eberron wanting to like march across the Mornland, which you shouldn't do, but they wanted to do it. And he wanted to like, you know, work with them on this. Um, and it's something I know I could work on better because I DM for a bunch of kids. And so they have absolutely bonkers ideas sometimes, um, which frequently are, you. that's way beyond your ability. You can't do a called shot. You can totally, we can say you hit him in the eye with your arrow, but that doesn't do any extra damage because it's not a thing. Um, or that's not how a doorway works. You can't hide there <laughs> kind of stuff, but it bums them out when I say that. So um, I thought it was interesting because he talked about that part of it being more kind of collaborative, which reminded me of this game. Um, like if you're going to say, I want to do this cuckoo thing, it's like, okay, how are you going to do this cuckoo thing? Yeah. Since we mm -hmm. frequently ask you to do cuckoo things. I did start reading that um, post actually. I was worried that Aaron, you had written a post and I was like, oh no. I didn't see it. Yeah, yeah I read started reading post. the thing by Keith. Um, Keith is a pretty savvy storyteller and uh, GM, so. Keith is extremely sharp. Mm -hmm. And he has mm -hmm. very, I find his world building ideas really cool. Like I frequently am just like, damn, where did that come from? Um, yeah. Um, I feel like after I read that article, like I totally agreed with everything that he said. I think that one of the most fun things about like D and D for for me when I DM is seeing like what sort of things my players want to try, and then even if it's something that in my head I'm like, man, that sounds really like not a great idea. Can we or, talk like, about how impossible. your players went and stepped to the bitch queen? Uh, sure. Yeah, we could talk about that. <laughs> we should talk about that in a bit because I think that that's. That's interesting. So I think it's uh, a good example, sort of a good example. It's a little, <laughs> a little like I said, a bunch of clues for you guys, but yeah. But you know, you you were like, okay, then we're gonna do that instead of being like, no, you can't. Yeah, but I, I think like part of this is also like if somebody wanted to do uh, like an impossible shot, like let's say like a called shot from like a thousand feet away with just mm -hmm. like a regular short bow or something, and you're not proficient in it. Um, 
I would absolutely let them just make the attempt, but I would then, because I think that that's then like a teachable moment. You could show somebody like what it would take in order for that to actually succeed. Yeah. So then you could step through the things like, oh, you know, you could be proficient. Maybe, you know, it could be magical. The ammo could be magical, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Because like for my group, I have a group of five, mm -hmm. but two of one of them is like really casual, has been playing for like, decades but has never been like a rules person has always been more into like the lore and the setting and she sort of just like ignores most of the rule um and the another one is just like completely new this is her first time ever playing a, a tabletop rpg and i think that um the other three are very experienced and sometimes over the course of the adventure like they don't teach her like what they don't teach they teach her how they play basically but like what i try to do is i try to encourage her to like find her own style of play by like encouraging her like whatever ideas and then teaching her the mechanics that she would need in order to do those things if that makes sense yeah that does i think a little bit of it um goes to player expectations like <clears throat> Uh, this is an easily overlooked aspect of games that sometimes players are expecting to be uh, just really, really heroic and pull off fantastic things because they're just really cool and strange. And sometimes people are looking for a more grounded, you know, by the book sort of experience. And that's a good thing. That's a good conversation to have with your players as you go through. Um Otherwise, it's entirely possible that you end up in a in a situation in a game later where one person's like, I want to do this really cool, crazy, impossible thing. And everyone else is like, no, you can't do that. And then whatever you as the DM decide, someone's going to be unhappy, right? Because the player doesn't get to do their thing or the other players get upset that the player got to do this uh, impossible thing. Yeah. The kids I, D or I DM for, obviously, they are nine years old, so their their um, understanding of this game is very new. But if you kind of like took a regular player and dialed them up to eleven, it looks like this a little, because um, there's also a bit of like if I let the warlock do a bonkers thing that breaks the bends the rules, then everybody has to be able to do it. If I let him have this like magic item he made up everybody gets a magic item they made up at that point and some of that is like okay who cares right they're having fun yes the game is a little broken but they're the only people i have to please here um but then the, and there's things like my son has a has a dampier rogue that he really wants to be able to he wants to be he basically wants to be stark he wants to disappear in the shadows but he doesn't want to think about where's a good place to disappear. So this is where I push him. He's like, I want to hide. And I'm like, you're in a brightly lit room. What are you going to do? He's like, I'm going to push myself up against the wall. I'm like, that's not going to work. So give me something else. Like, like, give me what would you need? Like, okay, there's pillars in the room. Okay. There's pillars in the room. Um, so that's a very specific kind of example, but there is a little bit of like, okay, you want to do this thing what can we do so this thing works or like you can't hide exactly but you could remember you have this magic item that lets you turn it to a bat so do that i let them yeah. have way too many magic items i mean magic items are fun sounds great they are but they have way too many magic items <laughs> <laughs> I, they, uh, want more. I, they constantly want more i mean what i mean me too you know like why not He's like, Mama, can we find an apparatus of qualish? I'm like, why? You're not near the water. He's like, but have you seen it? <laughs> yeah, but that's, yeah, that's the right reply. <laughs> and there's a little part of me like, okay, at some point, we're going to have to be by the water, and they're going to have to find a friggin' magic submarine because that will make his day. Mm -hmm. But also, no, you're not going to, on the first level of Undermountain, stumble upon an apparatus of qualish because where are you even going to put that, guys? Yeah. It's at but least got to be the water level. They do. Yeah, I would get to level three first. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a good place to put it. I do make sure, like, like, there's no reason to have good magic, really good magic items on level one of Undermountain. That thing's been pillaged a billion times. 
but it makes yeah. him so happy. So it's like, oh, guess what? Guess what mm -hmm. you found in there? Yeah, you found something that no, but everybody else overlooked. The the tricky thing is finding stuff that's like it does one thing and it's neat and it will be very applicable. I will make sure if it's applicable a couple times, but if you forget about it, it's okay and it's not going to make all the kids fight. Yeah. And I'm um, not giving them another curse magic item because that didn't go well. What was the first one? Uh, in the in the in the adventure, spoilers. There's a sword that if you pick it up, you cannot put it back down. I think uh, I told this story. Maybe oh, nice. I didn't. So like, yeah, they walk in this room. There's a sword. There's a skeletal hand on the blood stain on the floor. And my son goes, "Don't pick that sword up. It's cursed." Um, and the kid who's now a war he wants to change characters constantly so i just said oh you walked through a mild magic zone and now you what are you now but the time he was a paladin now he's a warlock anyway okay he doesn't he's, he's still learning how to do a narrative but he just wants to play um so he wanted the sword but as soon as he grabbed the sword my son was like ah uh, no i want the sword so now they're fighting over this sword and they're like they are absolutely the types to get a little wound up and start saying my character punches you in the face i eldritch blast Whoa. you and i have to break that that up yeah. um but the so the sorcerer is like trying to like pull them apart and he's like what spells do i have and i'm sitting here like kid took the sword that is glued to his hand. So finally, like they break up and I'm like, um, you, you know, you knock it, you feel like it should go, but you pull his arm instead, because guess what, Keto, you're holding that sword permanently. Um, and, and he was absolutely furious because <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> as good as his other sword. And I was sitting here like, you had a warning. So he had to tote it around for a while. And then eventually he was like, can I please put this sword down? And so I made up a story reason that the sword like became uncursed so he didn't have to keep carrying it because they need to learn some of these lessons maybe arguably but they don't need to go past the point of actually no longer enjoying it yeah i've had like <laughs> i use that one cursed item which is like the coin and every time you spend it it doubles like yeah. it goes back to your pocket it doubles and then the idea is that eventually it'll multiply so much that the weight will like crush the the cursed person to death <laughs> so when Whoa. my player found this out, instead of being like, oh no, I need to uncurse myself, they were like, who do I hate the most in this world? <laughs> and then they went to them and they were like, let's gamble tonight. And then they like purposely lost to them over and over until the point where like um, they were about to be crushed. And then he like embraces the other character, the NPC, and he crushes both of them <laughs> using the coins. <laughs> wow. Yep. Just, I have to tell it. I'll tell Choices. this to the kid that keeps changing character classes. I'm like, okay, find a way to spectacularly destroy your character in a fit of hubris, and you can be somebody else. Yeah, I feel like that. That's really like the the key, right? Is like the it's like just doing whatever you do spectacularly. So like, I actually really like giving my characters, especially if they're uh, like under level, um, my PCs. I mean, like something really powerful, both as a uh inspiration for like their imagination but also as like a fail safe so if they get into like an oh shit situation they have something that they could like fall back on um and in this case like for this particular party that i'm dming right now and they were about level five or six i had them like rescue a genie arid and then uh it gave them essentially like an alter reality well mm. like one wish Oh, and neat. they could like summon this genie at any point during the adventure and then just make that wish. They banked that wish for like the next five levels. And then when they finally used it, they used it to spite my BBEG. <laughs> Instead of killing him, they wished for his mouth to seal up so he would shut up. <laughs> and not be able to say his <laughs> diabolical monologue. <laughs> it was a great moment. That was pretty funny. You don't even have a Discord to post that on later, do you? No. I guess you could just email them and be like, here, this is what he would have said. Yeah. No, I let them have their victory. They they don't need to know his speech. <laughs> I can just trash can it. Or just say recycle it. And then recycle somebody else it. will deliver the that next... speech later. <laughs> like, 
wait, you're talking about something different. Like I feel very passionately about <laughs> my um, colleagues' victories and, and defeats. So sit down. I don't think you have another wish spell. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. I let them roll on a magic table once and the, the class switching kid got a luck blade. And I was like, okay, here's the deal though. That wish spell, all of you have to agree on what it is. No nice. one person gets the wish spell. They have never used it. So uh -huh. I don't know if that they, rem again, I give them too many magic items. So I don't think they really, I don't know if they remember they still have it, but. My son does love his cloak of the bat very much. And yeah, I find that. He got a homebrew thing from an adventure we played through, like the Dagger of the Dark Knight. And he was very into that. He's definitely playing a little mini edge lord. It's cute. Sweet. Yeah. Bat cape and a, and a dark knife. Also, when I let them go through the thing and sort of tweak their class and their race and stuff, he decided he wasn't a dragonborn anymore. He was a dragonborn dampier. Mm. Oh, nice. He has a Dampier uh, soul knife. Dang. Okay. Which he is the sweetest, sunniest little boy, but this is definitely. definitely He's living his fantasies, jam. his edgelord fantasy. Mm -hmm. That's a bit like me as a player. If you know me in real life, I'm I'm generally a pretty <laughs> laid back kind of sunny sort of guy most of the time and when i run games they're you know very story heavy and very role play heavy and then i become a player and i'm just like edgelord murder hoboing it up all the time and it's it's crazy because it's like a like a release valve for me and it's not like i i go to this intentionally it's because i start with a with a heavy story based character and then i find that that character is utterly useless in whatever game I'm playing because it's not one that I designed. So it's not, you know, the kind of story that I built the character for. And so my follow-up characters get increasingly destructive and angry. I'm not sure that's a flattering story about me, but it is a story about <laughs> me. Um, so we have about like three minutes before we recap is there any cool. other is there something anybody else wants to talk about mm -hmm. uh, i could talk about like my i guess i could try really quickly to talk about like my almost tpk in my game yeah yeah <laughs> oh yeah so um eric i'm not sure if i told you about this but basically um my group they needed to go to a temple of um, temple of umberly in order to get some information from one of the priests so instead of going there, like sneaking around to get the info, which I had in their office, or like interrogating the priest, they go in, take him to a confessional, assassinate him, and then attempt to um, like question his corpse. But in the course of that, they get discovered by some of the guards, and then they basically end up just killing everybody in the entire uh -huh. church, and then rededicating it to Timora instead of Umberly. <laughs> and then right. they go on a ship. Up, 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 up. immediately like the next thing so of course umberly comes like the waves start rolling uh shatters the boat i give them that, like that's just tempting fate is what that is it's not even yeah. really tempting fate it's like <laughs> suicide by lore is what it is it's like someone watched yeah. odysseus and went hold my beer yeah exactly yeah, but I gave them, you know, I gave like them I just blinded the Cyclops. He doesn't know who I am. I got away with it. Oh, I'm just going to shout my name. Everything will be fine. How could like, this I'm go gonna wrong? I'm going to do that instead. I'm going to also shout my home address, my social security <laughs> yeah. number. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I didn't, you didn't blind the Cyclops. Them. You literally blinded Poseidon. But... Uh, I gave them a bunch of chances. I was like, Umberly's basically demanding like recompense for her church. Uh, they tossed in, the first time they tossed in like 50 gold. And then one of the players tried to weasel their way out by being like, oh, they're so miserly. So like 25 gold is like, it's so tragic for her to give up. It's like the equivalent of giving up like 100,000 gold emotionally. I was like, mm, you know, Umberly doesn't care. <laughs> like she, she only cares about the material value of stuff. So, uh, you know, second shot, True. you know, give her recompense. Uh, they throw in like 300 gold and a copy of a book that one of them is writing. And so Umberly like has the waves like splatter and the book comes out like a soggy mess and like hits, you know, hits one of them in the chest. And I was like, last chance. 
like the waves are getting huge it's about to like wreck the ship you know like what will you give her so they end up giving her 500 pieces of gold not into it wrecks the boat and so the next time she's like in front of them the, her avatar there's like sharks around like the various pieces and she's basically like making demand now she's like straight up telling them like this is what i want otherwise i'm going to like kill you all and uh you know they have essentially like these chances to negotiate with her uh but the very first thing that she asks for is that there's like a druid of shantaea she hates shantaea so yeah. she's like oh uh the very first thing is like the necromancer who's evil is like oh i will go over to your side and i will worship you and you will be my deity and i will be your loyal follower so she's like Okay, prove it. Shove this druid into the water. Give me this <laughs> druid of Shantaea. And like all the players, like one player, the paladin was like, wait guys, this is a bad idea. But then the necromancer's like, shove. Oh yeah, just <laughs> shove. Um, yep, yep. Oh my crap. Okay, uh, so we have to go to the recap because we're it's going to be close on time. But I don't know, maybe I'll finish the story some other time. Okay. But I jinx. All right, see you in a bit. Don't go away. You know, how didn't I see that coming? So we've got a lot going on this time, and, well, a lot of it was talking, which, great, fantastic, I love me some drama. So we pick up where we left off. The sisters were confronting who they found in the garden, which turned out to be the Spear Witch, Skaha, their mother, or at least some variation of her. Obviously, there's timelines to take into account. It's a whole thing and it gives me a headache. Cecilia is pretty quick to storm off. Unsurprisingly, she doesn't really seem to want anything to do with any version of her mother, leaving Artemisia to talk to her, which was an interesting conversation. Very enlightening. Found out more about the whole turning into a dragon and killing a bunch of people thing, so that's that's fantastic. Back inside, you had a lot of people talking to their kids, essentially, or their future alternate children. Rogar was still trying to get through to Rigan and convince him that he actually was Rogar. But as he was talking to Rigan, he met another of the survivors, which seemed to be a young half-elven woman, who introduced herself as a Vamos. How many Vamoses do we remember? And how many elves are among the Vamos? Could she be Aiden and Kayla's kid? How many other people have kids running around here? Do I have a kid? I mean, I bet Iller and I would make beautiful babies. And that sounded weird. Hogar later rejoins Stong, and they grilled Lazar a bit about the possibility of breaking the mind control that controls these witches, since they had been informed that all of the witches were under some kind of compulsion by the Witch Queen. Of course, without a witch to experiment on, Lazar didn't really have much he could offer. And then Rogar decided to ask Lazar for parenting advice, which was surprisingly insightful, but honestly, still not helpful in the given situation i'm sorry when you're walking up to your kid and going hi i'm your parent from an alternate timeline where i haven't had you yet i want to be nice and have a relationship it doesn't tend to go over well does it especially when they didn't have a good relationship with the previous version of you or in rogar's case didn't actually know you at all i wouldn't call it rogar's fault it's not his fault that this version of sarshan killed him because yeah that happened well, Cecilia ended up having a nice heart-to-heart -heart with Lazar, or some kind of conversation at the very least. I'm not really sure you could call it a heart-to-heart, heart-to-dagger-to-heart, -heart, because he still has the knife in his chest, which someone should really do something about that. And Lazar revealed, of all things, that he'd kept something from them. Oh my! As it turns out, the spell he cast, when it ends, will not immediately send them all back to where they came from. So, you know, no spell ending and suddenly you're whisked back in the nick of time to the Prime Material. Instead, whoever's still on the plane when the spell ends is stuck there. At least until the spell can be cast again. Apparently, apparently, Lazar's whole plan was to bring them all there, wait until the last minute, and then send everybody but himself home. And that way, he would be free of them for good. Well, as it turns out, this plane is even worse than the one they just left for him. So, gee, I wonder. 
Is it all that surprising that he decided to come clean and just be like, no, I'm going back. I, I don't care how bad it is there, I'm going back. Well, the Irregulars eventually convened so that they could plan for their next steps. Given their limited time and the new information they had about the whole being trapped there thing, which isn't good for anybody, they went over what they already knew, talked about, I mean, it was a strategy meeting. The thing that made it interesting was when Sturge stepped out of nowhere. Cecilia had previously talked to him earlier in the evening, but now, in the presence of everyone, the jig was up. See, that wasn't Sturge, and it hadn't been for a bit now. Rogar cast True Sight upon himself, or True Seeing, whatever it's called, but this allowed him to see through the magic that was cloaking the individual that had taken Sturge's place. It was this wiry, decrepit individual wearing a mirror mask, of all things. Talk about creepy. Well, when called out, the individual removed the mask, and it turned out it was Bane, of all people. God, every timeline I learning hate her. Cecilia didn't exactly wait for the mask to come off before blasting her. And then, of course, the decrepit Fane delivered a message from the Witch Queen. Something about a spire on the mount? There are any mountains near Westgate, are there? Maybe it was spire. Maybe it was something else. The Irregulars seemed to think that the mount might mean the giant astral dreadnought chained over the city, and that maybe the Witch Queen's fortress was built on its back. But it looked like the showdown was coming sooner rather than later. And hey, they knocked out Fane, which means that Lazar has the witch he needs to experiment on. Best of luck, buddy. <laughs>